I'm uh, usually more focused on highlighting my own work. Uh, and in this, I, I wanted to try to have a bit more of a, a, a bit broader approach and incorporate some of the other existing uh, literature and findings uh, to explore this, this overarching question that many of us have. And I assume everyone uh, here on this um, webinar uh, slash Zoom uh, meeting have, which is understanding what the underlying or the, the real like driving mechanisms of, of TMS. So um, that's uh, that's my main focus for this. Uh, I have no relevant disclosures, but these are my funding sources. And uh, I usually will start with some sort of sport analogy. Uh, you can pick literally anything. Um, and I think that this is really the only uh, introduction slide, which is, um, and, and I assume most of the people here have a, a understanding of TMS and, and um, most people wouldn't be interested in the TMS mechanisms if they didn't uh, already have that awareness. So uh, this is kite surfing. And um, again, you can pick basically anything. Uh, if you understand how a thing works, then you can optimize it and make it better. And that's the, the main idea here. And so sometimes you don't necessarily just want, you know, more power or speed, like with an engine, sometimes you you want to be able to do different things. You want to be able to do like big air, or you want to be able to do uh, um, freestyle or wave riding or something like that. And and uh, again, you think TMS, there's sometimes we want to have more inhibitory, excitatory, and I'll, I'll touch on that a bit. But uh, in this case, I went with a big air and uh, was was very pleased. And so because of the understanding of the wind dynamics, they're able to design a kite that can um, fit that need perfectly. So. So what we're hoping to do today is to peer into and uh, discuss a little bit what is in this black box of TMS, where we can take someone that was depressed and then they're happy. And, and ever since this was uh, initially discovered in the uh, early 90s and published in 95, 94, uh, we have been uh, working backwards to try to better understand how this works. So there's different levels, uh, first of all, uh, that this is working on. Uh, we stimulate, of course, and and uh, for depression, the DLPFC, um, OCD, and the DMPFC, and then of course a, a host of other investigative indications, uh, uh, depending on which network we want to activate. And as you can see from all the arrows on the side, uh, and as you all know, there's many interactions between these levels, uh, so nothing operates in isolation. But also, as the arrows indicate, most of the specificity uh, in terms of uh, what network, what circuit is activated, um, and even where DNA uh, is transcribed and proteins are delivered to, uh, these kind of revolve around a bit of a hub, I would say, uh, which is the synapse. And I uh, do admit a bias. My training was in synaptic plasticity uh, in grad school, and so I, I tend to see things through this lens, but I've made an effort to sort of zoom out and, and uh, hopefully get to a more inclusive view of, of all the different things that TMS is doing at these different levels. Uh, so to focus then on synaptic plasticity, uh, just as a uh, quick background, we have at baseline, we have AMPA receptors that mediate most of the excitatory current in a, in a glutamatergic or excitatory synapse. These are really the mediators of um, signal from one neuron to another. And most of the other things that we often think about, like monoamines, these modulate, so they kind of tune up and down, but these are the main focus. Uh, in um, animal protocols, I'm going to try and clear up a little bit of the, the, the nomenclature here. Uh, in um, animal protocols with electrical stimulation, low frequency stimulation causes <clears throat> long-term depression or LTD. And this is mediated through a uh, low level, um, kind of a chronic low level amount of calcium through um, primarily the NMDA receptors, and uh, these ultimately activate calmodulin and calcineurin, and it leads to removal of receptors. And on the flip side, high-frequency stimulation protocols, or if you pair a somewhat low frequency with a depolarization, you can accomplish the same purpose. Um, ultimately, just uh, allows for activation of the NMDA receptor. You get a, a acute high level of calcium flowing in. Uh, this delivers GLUA1 specific type of receptors to the synapse. And uh, this also leads to things like spine size increase. Now, if we block the NMDA receptor, it's this is I'm highlighting this because it's a very it's a key receptor in the whole process. There's multiple things that are necessary for LT, LTP uh, and LTD, but it, this is NMDA is is one of those key ones, and and as I'll talk about a little bit later, um, also sufficient to increase it. So, 
one of our questions in in the TMS and, and non-invasive brainstem field is, does the low frequency stimulation that we see with LTD, does this equate to one hertz RTMS or to continuous theta burst stimulation? Uh, and on the flip side, does high frequency stimulation correlate with 10 hertz or 20 hertz or, or some other uh, high frequency stimulation generally considered greater than five, uh, five or greater, uh, or intermittent theta burst stimulation? And uh, the um, one of the, the um, almost controversial questions, uh, you'll get your wrist slapped if you uh, say this wrong, uh, does low frequency RTMS, we often will say low frequency and, and we'll correlate that with inhibitory, uh, high frequency, uh, we'll correlate that with excitatory. And <clears throat> uh, to address that a little bit, I just want to point out why we uh, often associate them, but we can't always associate them. And and it really is because it's there's much more going on than just frequency. So uh, this is just some of the parameters. I, I left some off of uh, this graph just to, to highlight something. Um, if we just take, for example, uh, train duration alone, this is with 10 Hertz RTMS. If you do a five second session, you actually get an inhibitory effect. If you do a 1.5 second session, you get an excitatory effect. So these are excitatory and inhibitory protocols, but it's only in the greater picture of all the other things going on. So that's, you know, to, to hopefully clarify some of the confusion why we, why we can't just say inhibitory is because, well, it depends on uh, what the other parameters are that are being used. So uh, hopefully that is, uh, provides some clarity. So to kind of get to um, a bit of a historical origin, usually I focus on history of TMS and how TMS got started. Uh, in this case, as I said, uh, skipping all of that just to get you know, right into the meat of all of this. So that the uh, earliest report looking more mechanistically, uh, and this is aside from seeing a clinical effect and seeing enduring um, changes from excitability, like with motor evoke potentials in animals uh, weighing it all, they found that uh, as the frequency increases, you get increased frequency of spikes um, indicating uh, a, an LTP like effect. And just move my screen out of the way. Um, and then uh, a few years later, uh, Ahmed found that uh, 15 Hertz is able to increase uh, LTP-like response greater than the lower frequencies. Uh, and uh, this is after a, a fairly thorough review of the literature. Um, these are, you know, the fairly limited findings. And then uh, we finally skip uh, forward to uh, this study, which actually used 100 hertz, so it's beyond what we use clinically uh, or in humans, uh, even experimentally. Um, and uh, they found that the, the black circles here are AP5. This is an NMDA receptor, a very specific NMDA receptor antagonist uh, that blocked the potentiating effect that they found here. So uh, so this was some you know general descriptions, uh, and I would kind of describe these as somewhat descriptive findings. And then um, Andres Flacos and uh, his group did what I, I think is the most um, uh, specific uh, evidence towards LTP. So so they did find that uh, similar to the others that you have increased uh, frequency as well as amplitude of these AMP receptor mediated um, excitatory postsynaptic currents. Um, and these essentially reflect spontaneous activity of, of glutamatergic synapses. Uh, they also found that spine size increases uh, in synapses that received magnetic stimulation. And they, uh, this is in slices, uh, so it's not transcranial. And it is, uh, let's see, what was I going to say? I lost my train of thought, sorry. Um, the, uh, they looked also at uh, pairs of uh, neurons together and found that in those that had uh, magnetic stimulation, uh, those they had a larger AMPA receptor mediated response here. So all of these are are things that we typically would study in a classical LTP type of an experiment. Um, and uh, in addition to GLUA one levels, so GLUA one, as I mentioned before, is specific and in, specifically involved in LTP. And they found that three hours after magnetic stimulation uh, or post magnetic stimulation, there was larger and more uh, puncta of these. Uh, stained GLUA1 receptors. And so these basically are visualizing what is at synapses. So there's more per synapse and there's more of them. Um, and so all of this uh, literature is very consistent uh, with each other. And, and, I, and I think some of the um, 
really most specific evidence of LTP. Uh, what I thought also is quite interesting is uh, more recently, the correlation I, I, I find very fascinating, the relationship between long, you know, synaptic plasticity and between learning and memory. And, and uh, I won't get into the, the extensive uh, field and background that that is, but to have found some of these findings with TMS, I, I think was quite interesting. Uh, and I would just point out here that this severe foot shock group is uh, essentially a depression uh, model in rats and uh, immobility describes essentially um, you know what would be thought of as a depressed state or uh, or apathy in in mice uh, or rats rather. And so they had quite a bit of immo immobility here as you can see in the circle, the black circles. Um, and then when you combine those with theta burst stimulation, um, given every day over seven days, you actually improve the mobility uh, there. And you see the same thing with an, a similar forced swim test. And uh, this correlates with uh, LTP. Uh, so this is uh, theta burst induced. And you can see that uh, only the sham group doesn't potentiate. And then in the, the far right one, uh, they found the same thing in the ability to induce uh, LTD. And so bidirectional plasticity here was uh, uh, was brought into tact, and they they further found similar to Andre's group that saw uh, larger uh, spines. They found that the uh, and more uh, spines uh, in synapses. They found here that the number of of synaptic, which would be dendritic intersections, was uh, rescued essentially with a theta burst group in in this depression model. Um, and um, similar to the mushroom spines, describe a, a mature, more stable kind of spine that had all of the scaffolding proteins and, and receptors delivered there. And, and again, we see that the theta burst rescue and even went beyond uh, the, the control group. So this was uh, really, I think, impressive level of evidence on, on multiple levels. And they also found some uh, biochemical changes in proteins that we know were involved uh, with synaptic plasticity like BDNF, CAM kinase 2. Uh, so this is the uh, the animal, some of the animal level evidence, specifically investigating LTP like effects of of TMS of some sort. But the reason we care about this is because we deliver this in humans, and so if uh, uh, it does you know, and many times we see what is in animals doesn't always translate to humans. So so we're we're interested, and many of us are interested in this. Uh, so one of the ways, and, and by far the most common way that this has been investigated is motor evoke potentials. And uh, in uh, some of these paradigms, we'll, we'll look at this, uh, we'll look at baseline excitability. Uh, we'll then do some sort of a plasticity protocol, and then we'll look at post, and we'll see that the uh, difference is plasticity. And then we do this in the presence of receptor modulation. So we can block, for example, or uh, increase the activity of an MDA receptor. Uh, and by giving TMS while we're doing this, we see what the relative role of that is, similar to those animal experiments that block NMDA receptors and, and it blocks the effect, for example. Uh, and so we look at the change in MEP as an index of plasticity. So um, <clears throat> these three experiments, several of them, uh, and, a, and a lot of the literature out there has actually looked at paired associative stimulation, where you stimulate the median nerve, uh, at a specific time interval that can induce either LTP or LTD-like effects uh, when it's combined with a TMS pulse. Uh, and these produce a robust plasticity. And, and these three groups here all show that with an NMDA receptor and, and with a Walters group, um, uh, also with a calcium channel blocker, that they were able to block the effects of the paired associated stimulation. Um, I, I haven't focused a lot on PAS because we don't use that clinically. And that's part of what I'm interested in is what we do in the clinic, like how is that happening uh, at the synaptic level? And so uh, the earliest study that uh, looked at this uh, specifically in something that is now used in, in humans is uh, intermittent theta burst, uh, of course, developed by um, uh, Huang et al. and John Rothwell's group. And uh, they found that uh, that NMD antagonist, NMD receptor antagonist, memantine blocked the effect of, uh, of ITBS. So there's consistent evidence that blocking NMDA blocks the effects of TMS. And this is consistent towards uh, this, this model of TMS working through LTP. Um, and 
just because something is necessary doesn't mean that it's sufficient. And so I uh, like analogies in general. And so I give this analogy, like to become, say, a neurologist, uh, you have to go to grade school. And I'll, I'll speak for the United States specifically. There, I realize it varies a bit by um, by country and region. Uh, you have to go to grade school. You have to graduate in order to go to college. You have to graduate college in order to go to med school. Uh, and you have to take, um, in order to uh, take the board exam, you have to go to med school, and then you have to pass these board exams. And that allows you to go to residency. And uh, so this is the the process and then um, further exams after residency, of course. So uh, grade school is necessary. College is necessary. Med school, board exams, these are all necessary, as is residency. Um, residency is the only thing that's necessary and sufficient such that when you complete it, you are uh, a neurologist in this example. So uh, with that in mind, uh, residency, we would say maybe is the most specific thing that gives us an idea if someone is um, uh, a, a neurologist. So what about with LTP? This would be uh, increasing activity in the end receptor. So if we could say that it's, if we could say that increased NMD receptor activity is sufficient to uh, enhance plasticity, then we would be able to uh, have a, a, a strengthened level of evidence. So uh, we did uh, uh, basically the same paradigm, a uh, crossover study pre-post uh, is commonly done. And uh, at baseline, it's important to note that D-cyclosterine by itself doesn't have an effect on the excitability. It's you think of an NBA receptor, you, you not only have to have something that activates that receptor, uh, but you also have to have the depolarization. You have to have some activity there for it to have any effect. And so we don't see anything at baseline, but after our TMS plasticity protocol, we see that above and beyond what, this is a 10 Hertz uh, protocol, above and beyond what placebo uh, plus 10 Hertz does, D-cycloserine further increases that. So we see that there's, an, there's a TMS induced plasticity, and then we see this more LTP specific, and I say that because of the NMD receptor activity, uh, more specific enhancement. Um, and so we do see increased plasticity in the motor cortex. And um, in a, a replication uh, experiment that we did, uh, we again saw that D-cycloserine increased over placebo. Uh, and then we combined it with dextromethorphan. So we actually had a pill that had both D-cycloserine and dextromethorphan to see if sort of, you know, hearkening back to the uh, animal experiments that we would do uh, where we have a very specific effect and we knock that down and we see that it takes it away. We we wanted to see if we could get that in this dirtier drug version of humans and maybe give also some specificity to the NMDA um, uh, effect. And so we blocked this increase and uh, in NMDA activity and we saw um, a decrease. Um, and so uh, of course it's not a, a full all the way down to placebo level, but we thought this was quite interesting. This is uh, in preparation, we're working on this now. And um, the other thing about this protocol is that it was the, the first time that we had or anyone had done uh, an actual um, more, it, it, we still used 80% because we're in the motor cortex to avoid seizure, but otherwise we used a clinical protocol, uh, which was 3000 pulses and uh, the four second, 20 second duty cycle. And um, we found a, kind of a, a additional level of evidence. We see that, uh, that, with a recruitment curve or an input output curve that there's a left shift, which indicates excitability. And we can see that a little bit more with the D-cycloserine. This is a um, uh, fairly small effect uh, as we typically see with these there and they tend to be less robust, but uh, nonetheless, we see a, a, a we can see more um, with greater precision as well though, just part of the reason that we did this. So Jamie Kwan is the uh, uh, research assistant featured here and um, is a um, outstanding, um, we have a, a few things with her on here. Uh, so she's done a fantastic job with this. And uh, we wanted to further look into the, the mechanism by looking at paired pulse. So you have a, with paired pulse, just very briefly, probably many are familiar, uh, you have a, a single pulse, just your regular TMS pulse and EMG peak to peak amplitude. And then with intercortical inhibition, ICI, uh, you have short inner stimulus interval, um, uh, usually three seconds, less than five. Uh, and by pairing these together, we think that it activates GABA uh, neurons preferentially, this subthreshold prepulse we think does this. 
And so that when you have the test pulse after, there's already this gabatonin, it decreases. And, and so we think that this is uh, uh, essentially a reflection of that gabatonin. Now, at 15 milliseconds out, uh, this uh, supposedly has gone into uh, refraction. And so we're, we have decreased gabatonin. It's sort of unmasking of the glutamatergic tone. So we can look more specifically at that. So, so with this paired pulse paradigm in mind, we um, took the same thing. We looked at ICF. And we essentially saw in the placebo group before TMS, we kind of get this normal ICF um, in our cortical facilitation. And then after the 10 Hertz, we see it's, you know, this angle is uh, increased and we see what looks to be an increased ICF. And we see the same kind of a thing with DCS, uh, again, more, more ICF. And then very interestingly, we found this, this occlusion effect um, that, that occurred. And you can see how high the baseline is and there's just not as much room to go up in the decycloserian group. And uh, this is actually quite similar to a lot of uh, basic LTP literature and even some TMS literature that I'll show. Uh, essentially, uh, this is one of the one of the seminal experiments showing this, where they have a um, they have a learning experiment where they train and then they try and induce LTP, and you can see that they cannot achieve LTP uh, until they uh, add a, another protocol here. And then in the untrained hemisphere, they get normal LTP, but it does saturate after about two um, two trains of this. And so uh, we essentially see uh, we refer to this as occlusion. And uh, I'll, I'll show something in a second, um, but we do see a, an occlusion type of an effect with uh, with TMS protocols as well. Um, and I. Uh, in the in the last hour, we were working on troubleshooting the other webinar thing, and uh, I'm hoping I didn't leave that slide off or or hit or something. But um, uh, and then in the flip side, looking at short intercortical inhibition, uh, again the same sort of paradigm. We see uh, normal sicky, um, less of a GABA dependent process. We think uh, they'll get to that as well. Uh, so we see a similar um, slope here. D-cycloserine has, uh, it seems like a flattened out a little bit less of that inhibition. And then uh, after the 10 Hertz combined with the D-cycloserine, uh, this is where we see this effect. And it seems to be maybe a homeostatically aided uh, sicky phenomenon. And so uh, that uh, we, this is, this is essentially this homeostatic plasticity, uh, probably many are familiar with. Um, many people also are, are often confused exactly on what this is. The basic idea is that you uh, give repeated excitatory stimulation, increased activity uh, over time, and uh, well, increased activity will actually cause a, a shrinking of these synaptic responses, whereas uh, decreased activity would cause an increase. And so it's basically this, the the neurons desire to, and not desire, but you know, uh, response to pushing it in one direction, it will bring it back towards the middle. So it remain scalable. Uh, so, okay, so this is what I was thinking that I had in here. Uh, this is a, a really nice study, I think, by um, uh, Mirakami and colleagues, and they essentially gave either continuous theta burst or intermittent theta burst before giving another protocol. So it's kind of like that real Podote, um paper that I was just showing uh, from, from 2000, and uh, you, you could see a sort of a saturation effect. So when you start with continuous theta burst, you get this homeostatic aided potentiation. Uh, and on the flip, if you prime with intermittent theta burst and then you give it again, uh, you occlude that effect. So this is similar to uh, what we saw in, and we see the exact same thing essentially in continuous theta burst where we have a, um, a uh, continuous theta burst primed um, blocking, uh, whereas when it's, or an IT best prime, sorry, and then with continuous theta burst, well, we get a potentiation when we follow it up. Uh, and so this is actually a reversal, which is something that we see in some of the other literature, um, particularly with intermittent, particularly with decycloserine and intermittent theta burst that I'll, I'll get to in a, in a bit. Um, one of the things that we can do in humans is, uh, you know, we uh, don't give the same sort of really specific agents that they'll give to animals or in slice cultures, but caffeine is a natural stimulant that many of us use. Um, this group used an acute dose of caffeine and found that uh, caffeine actually blunted the um, response among all people, and particularly among those that were just classified as a, a greater responder, they had a higher MEP, 
of those that had IRMAPs, most of those were people that did not get the caffeine. Um, so this was an acute effect. And uh, we were interested in chronic caffeine that about 80% of us use and probably most of us have had today. Uh, so uh, Meg Vigny um, led this study. Uh, this is uh, natural. So this is, I just want to clarify, this is uh, data from other primary studies. And we, we uh, looked at this as a post-hoc analysis uh, and uh, to generate hypotheses. These are preliminary data. Um, the N is small and it wasn't done in a perspective randomized fashion. This is uh, basically just identifying people that self-identify as caffeine users. We kept track of how much or ask them how much rather. And, and um, there's more to, to follow up on this, but you can see that uh, the red lines are notably higher than uh, the blue lines. The um, so the non-caffeine users seem to have this increased plasticity, and in this you know this panned out over uh, averaging these together. And on the uh, flip side of things, uh, we were interested in practice. Uh, in other words, motor learning and memory. So if someone does some something that uses uh, the motor cortex repeatedly, like musicians and athletes, uh, we found that that again, so this is post hoc analysis similar to the other study. Uh, but but I'm sharing both of these because I feel like they reflect on the underlying LTP like mechanism. Uh, these folks had a greater potential or greater ability to um, to respond to uh, plasticity protocol and to increase. Uh, and we again saw that these were were overall increased. And uh, as a follow up, we. Uh, in a uh, another uh, sample size, uh, we did this replication experiment, and the musicians and athletes are in yellow. The non-musicians and athletes are in blue. Uh, in just you know placebo group, just as normal, we see that there's a, a, a an on average a greater propensity. And you know we talk a lot about variability in this field, and there is a lot of it, and there's a lot of things that account for it. And this. You know, this is one of the things that may account for variability. And sometimes clinically, people ask, why do some people respond and some people don't? Um, of course, we see that across, you know, pretty much any intervention. But, uh, you know, these are these are some of the factors, prior learning, prior training, et cetera, may, may predispose someone. Uh, so more to be fleshed out there. But in the decycloserine group where we increased NMDA receptor activity, we saw uh, a, a more of an enhancement here. And then in that group where we combined with, uh, antagonist to extramethorphan, we see that that effect was blocked. Um, and uh, and then we also added lorazepam here as a GABA agonist. And I'll get to this a bit more in a minute, uh, but this, uh, you know, didn't have a uh, separating effect. So, so on that subject of GABA, uh, we've been talking about LTP-like effects, but none of the stuff in the brain is in isolation. So everything has, you know, I mentioned modulation uh, by monoamines and GABA is, of course, the primary inhibitory and uh, is even more numerous than glutamatergic neurons. And so what is the effect of these uh, on what we're finding here? And again, I go back to Andres Flacco's work and uh, Lenz and colleagues' um, paper. Uh, this is using the same protocol that they use, this 10 hertz magnetic stimulation of hippocampal slices. And uh, instead of looking at the excitatory synapses, they looked at the inhibitory and they found that there was decreased inhibition of uh, or decreased amplitude of the inhibitory postsynaptic currents. So these are, you, you, you apply drugs so that you block AMP receptors, NMDA, et cetera, and you only get the GABA mediated effect. And they found that that was decreased in the magnetic stimulation group uh, and uh, found the same thing here with this paradigm. And then they further uh, went to characterize this and found that the receptor numbers, uh, specifically the alpha-2 uh, subtype, was decreased, and that the gefferin protein that is the scaffolding protein for these receptors was also decreased. So found a very nice uh, mechanistic relationship, but it, it raises this sort of puzzling thing of like, is it through an LTP-like effect or GABA or both? Um, and when I say GABA with this excitatory and it is it is excitatory uh tms this is uh through a cutting of those breaks so uh we wanted to again test this in humans using motor vote potentials and in this case we did this uh and i showed a little bit of the data from this um paradigm before where we had these four crossover visits uh we had placebo we had decycloserine and we had decycloserine plus dextromethorphan and then we had uh lorazepam, and then we would do 
uh, similar to the models that we've done before, baseline measures, do our TMS, and then and then post measures. And uh, what we found from that is uh, when uh, in normalized MEP data that the blue line, which is uh, blue and orange, um, some of the things we found, and it's it's not fully consistent across studies, we found that we had a greater effect at 30, and we were focused on the 30 minutes uh, post-TMS, but just showing the zero minutes here uh, to kind of see how that trend plays out. Uh, it, it, very interesting how the blue um, dextromethorphan group actually came down over time. Uh, not sure if that's just an effect of uh, variability or if it's, you know, um, uh, within sort of the realm of what we would be able to capture with error bars, or if that's uh, actually like a time-specific effect, there's uh, plenty to sort of sort through with that. But the again, the interesting thing that we found is that uh, decycloserine once again uh, enhanced plasticity, and we're seeing a very uh, persistent uh, effect of this with decycloserine across our studies and some studies I'll share uh, from Alex McGurr. And uh, this NMDA knockdown effect uh, was different. And then uh, I'll I'll explain the GABA idea. Um, if if what uh, what Andres group showed in and there's a decrease. We're cutting the break. We're we're removing amperes or sorry. We're mo removing GABA receptors by virtue of TMS. The thought is if we add lorazepam or or some agonist before and after, it's there in both situations. If there's less after, then there should be uh, less of a break after and therefore a, a, an increase or an, essentially an overall enhancement of, of MEPs. And we did not see that. So that was, uh, that differed from my hypothesis. Uh, I, I, my suspicion and, you know, this work needs to be replicated. It's preliminary um, and not even published yet, but, uh, you know, if this were to pan out to be true, uh, it would go against my hypothesis of what I had thought that I I thought 10 hertz might be working through both uh, based on on Andre's data. So uh, so that was interesting. And, um, you know, this this may bring up to some of you uh, that are familiar with this literature, uh, which is not extensive. There's not a ton of pharmacology TMS, and I'll talk about that as well. But uh, there's two studies previously that used intermittent theta burst plus d serine. Uh, and both of them showed not an enhancement. They decreased um, whether uh, whether they were considered occlusion or whether they were actually considered like a homeostatic uh, depression. In either case, uh, we consider that um, uh, to be potentially an occlusion effect. Whereas the 10 hertz effect, I, I consider to be a more modest uh, potentiation. And so we're able to see this increase that we talked about before. Um, so th that's kind of my my theory about this. And to refer back to uh, the evidence of this, right? Uh, we have when we prime with continuous theta burst, we have a potentiation. But the, in in our true group here, if we're adding two different things, decycloserine plus this intermittent theta burst, it might be too much uh, up front initially in the healthy subject, and that's important. This is, uh, and uh, there's a difference actually between depressed patients' plasticity and healthy folks' plasticity. And so we do all this study in healthy folks, and it, uh, you know, the the applicability to the depression groups is um, is in question, and uh, some of these things may not apply. And so, you know, in this data on the right, um, which we already talked about. So uh, the other comparison. Uh, you know, we we in the in the clinical realm, we usually refer to ten hertz and intermittent theta burst. We think of them as just being the same. Um, and so, are they really the same? And I've I've wondered about this. This is from the original uh, or for the FDA cleared uh, Bloomberger trial that showed that these um, clinically had a very similar effect. And then we looked at uh, the clinical that I mentioned before, ten hertz protocol, and the same clinical intermittent theta burst. Caveat being motor cortex, not in the DLPFC, and also 80% motor threshold. Uh, and those things can account for differences. And uh, and and so, you know, we have to take that into account and, uh, and consider that. But the thing that we see here as a difference between the 10 hertz and theta burst is that uh, that lorazepam effect, that increase after um, that I was expecting to see with 10 hertz, we didn't see it in 10 hertz, but we did see it with the intermittent theta burst group. 
And uh, and then, of course, uh, we pointed out already how the dextromethorphan decreased this, but not in the intermittent theta burst group. And uh, there's more to be sorted out here. Um, but some interesting preliminary signals with, with some of these things and some of the first studies that have uh, compared these two protocols. Um, and I was mentioning about how uh, ITBS is in healthy controls versus in disease. And I just showed those figures with healthy controls and how it caused this occlusion effect. Uh, but in fact, what we see with uh, in a group of depressed patients from Alex McGurr's group is that the cycloserine plus MDD group actually uh, normalized uh, the overall effect. Um, and with MDD uh, placebo by itself, there was an increase in the in the MEPs. And um, and so this, you know, this kind of brings up this overall question is, is all this stuff that we've been studying, does this actually translate into clinical improvements? And uh, again, um, I'm going to show a few things here from Alex, uh, who's done, uh, I think, some of the most interesting and, uh, you know, really fascinating work in this area. And I think, um, uh, you know, maybe among the most influential uh, down the road, uh, it seems to be not being talked about as much as uh, I and, and some of us in, in this area would expect, but uh, these effect sizes are huge. And what this means clinically, I, I, I don't think that uh, I can understate that really too much. So I think that that uh, this will will kind of rise to the top as getting more and more attention as, as far as a thing that can be helpful to patients, uh, which is as a clinician is what we're uh, quite interested in. So so they uh, they basically, his... Uh, study, they gave decycloserine or placebo along with ITBS for the first two weeks, and then they just gave regular ITBS uh, for the next two weeks, uh, only a four-week protocol. And the concern is, uh, as I mentioned, all that homeostatic plasticity stuff, if you push something too far, you don't want to flip it in the wrong direction. So uh, um, Alex, being the conservative scientist that he is and clinician, uh, did this protocol and, and nevertheless saw very marked effects, uh, very impressive. And then uh, this was published in JAMA Psych uh, just prior to uh, a year and a half ago now. And then he's followed this up with some data that he shared uh, that's not yet published and, and is potentially even stronger. So giving it for a longer uh, four weeks now, um, and this is, it was a weight-based dosing study to see what, this, what the serum levels, how these correlated uh, and based on weight. And you can see the individual projections here. And then I just wanted to show these, look at these remission rates. I mean, nearly 80% remission uh, post four weeks, uh, a durable change uh, that, um, you know, when we do a very short acting Tim protocol, protocol, we worry about the, the durability of that. And we see, and I think that uh, Alex and I would probably both agree on this, that you're adding decycloserine and you're engaging these synaptic plasticity mechanisms uh, in a way that's, uh, you know, durable. Um, and so much more to be done here and, and looked at here, but this is some uh, really exciting data. And this is all in depression. And, you know, the question is, well, could this apply to other disorders? And uh, um, sorry, I was, I was just going to show this as well before I skip to that transition. Uh, this showed the, uh, the relative uh, amount of decycloserine. So how much, how much serum decycloserine they actually had in their blood correlated very strongly with whether they went into remission or not. And so by simply looking at someone's decycloserine levels, you know, are we going to be able to push this upwards of above 90% remission rates? I mean, this is really incredible stuff. So uh, props to Alex and his group. And then going back to my transition, does this apply to other disorders? Uh, this is some preliminary data. And I believe he has some more data um, actually on this uh, higher end and uh, is, is uh, in on the way to being published now, but he did this with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and again, found a very similar effect with the decycloserine. So could this apply to Alzheimer's, to substance use? Um, you know, the field is really wide open here. And uh, from our lab, the Brainstem Mechanisms Lab, this is one of the areas that we're uh, particularly interested in. Uh, in addition to the decycloserine, this is, um, from a, a review that we um, uh, just had published, uh, led by Alex and uh, his uh, PhD student, uh, Maya, Maya Son. Uh, I'm going to go through each of these uh, individually. So at the excitatory synapse, 
the main thing I point out, you know, we have the the number of studies that each each done each has done, and you can just kind of look for general trends here. So the again with the decycloserine, you see really a lot of um, a lot of these upward green arrows showing an increase. So there's a really consistent effect, and at the same time, you see a lot of the blocked effect. So NMDA uh, has been giving us a pretty clear signal. But if we're looking for other ways to modulate other, you know, that's this is one drug that's been tested in this way. Uh, what about other drugs that might be able to be used to augment uh, the TMS effects? Um, <clears throat> calcium channel blockers uh, were, um, you know, very consistently blocking the effect. That's consistent with uh, an LTP-like mechanism, um, as uh, was shown in some of the prior data. Uh, though, um, you know, how we would use this. Uh, clinically, except for maybe in seizure disorder or something uh, where we need to decrease maybe anxiety or something. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, it's less clear if that's um, being blocked. Um, less obvious effect with um, some of these other uh, receptor modalities, um, even so sodium channel, which is also required for the NMD receptor. Uh, so kind of skimming through this quickly, I would refer folks uh, again to this review as a very thorough um, really thoroughly, very thoroughly put together. Uh, the uh, These are overlapping to the previous slide, but this over here, again, we don't see the real consistent signal from these uh, GABA receptor modulatory protocols. And uh, as far as our monoamines uh, that we typically think of, we, we don't have a lot of um, the uh, SSRI or serotonin. I forget I said SSRI, serotonin. Uh, but we do have a positive trial here. Um, we also have some signals within the acetylcholinesterase and, and um, uh, seeing this on a couple different levels. And then the dopamine. The dopamine depends quite a bit on the dose, but there's also some uh, consistent signals there. And so I think that there's quite a bit more to be explored here. Um, not nearly enough, I think, of the noradrenergic effects. Uh, one study so far showing uh, not much, but uh, this is, uh, you yeah, there's more to be done here. And then I'm going to kind of wrap up, uh, with just a series. There's a, a really nice review here. I wanted to touch on some of the ex extra synaptic TMS changes. And I realized that I'm, uh, you know, approaching the end of the time. Um, uh, please forgive me, uh, for, you know, as we did have a late start. And so I was hoping to be able to get through this quicker and uh, also had hoped to make some of this into, into figures, but haven't done that yet um, in putting this review together. But this is a great review that I'd refer people to that uh, discusses some of these things. And a, a good number of the studies that I've cited here are from that. Some of them are after it or, or not from that, though. So um, just to hit some major highlights, uh, we see that uh, there are changes in ion channels and intrinsic properties of, uh, of neurons. And uh, this includes... Uh, L-type, um, if you if you knock out or, or eliminate L-type calcium channels, this impairs your ability to have intermittent theta burst. Um, no changes from trip V1 channel, uh, but you do get changes from sodium and calcium channels as, as we'd expect. So uh, <clears throat> again, I apologize that I won't go through um, each of these. I'm just kind of hitting the, you know, some of the highlights. Uh, there's epigenetic changes that we see um, as a result of TMS where histone acetylase and, and CDK5 are increased. Uh, we see uh, quite a bit of uh, literature on early gene expression and, and also uh, intermediate and late. I actually should have taken that early off as I re revise this, um, as well as neuronal activity. So we see uh, quite a few markers and it's, and it's generally consistently increased. Um, there are some situations where it actually is decreased, um, such as this with continuous theta burst, um, calcium binding proteins. Etc. So this is again uh, just to sort of highlight that we do see uh, some of these other extra synaptic changes. Um, these are some of the synaptic ones that we've largely gone over, but uh, didn't highlight a few. And, you know, this is um, aside from the Vlaco study. These are actually from studies I haven't shown uh, that have nevertheless found increased LTP specific GLUA1, um, PSD95 is tightly associated with LTP. Uh, NR2B is an NMDA receptor subunit is especially associated in chem kinase too. So, so these are all also pretty, uh, quite consistent with that, that overall mechanism, uh, and, uh, signaling cascades. So once this, once these things happen in the synapse, uh, they're, you know, 
transported down these uh, signaling molecules to the DNA where we can actually uh, have the long lasting effect it requires DNA transcription, requires protein translation. Um, and so we see these those effects there. Um, we also see uh, uh, relatively understudied uh, glial fields. Um, uh, uh, Andy Fukuda is uh, working on helping us in this area. And uh, we also have some neurotrophic and neuroprotective uh, studies. And uh, as expected, we, we see quite a bit of BNF and it's a, a consistent signal. And I think that's the thing that's maybe a bit surprising. We see a lot of heterogeneity and in excitability responses, and we have you know this huge MEP variabilities, and we have a fair amount of clinical variability, but we do see quite a bit of uh, consistency uh, with some of these uh, molecular signals here. Moving up to this more network level, uh, there's a nice meta-analysis by uh, Kirkowski uh, that I'd also refer folks to, where they um, kind of globally among multiple different region, brain regions found that ITBS increased resting state functional connectivity whereas continuous theta burst decreased it. Um, there's network reorganization, and then there's some you know, really uh, sort of exciting work uh, correlating with the phase of, of the, the waveform uh, with uh, Olf Zeman and, and Chris Renner uh, leading the way in, in that area. So there's um, as well some EEG signals on resting state EEG. So there's, there's uh, clearly some network effects, and in and, and my opinion, these are likely subserved by some of these more um, synaptic and other molecular uh, causes. And then um, one of the things I find quite fascinating is, again, as I mentioned before, this, these correlations with plasticity and, and cognition, memory, behavioral performance. Uh, we again see more of these occlusion uh, finding, findings where you learn, it occludes uh, further responses in the acute sense as opposed to uh, uh, Jamie Kwan's findings that uh, plasticity was increased. And um, yeah, uh, we see that plasticity corresponds uh, in some of these studies to an overall clinical response, or at least predicts that clinical response. Uh, these are some, um, in, in addition, beyond just the BDNF uh, findings of increased protein, uh, there's also a fair amount of evidence that the BDNF um, polymorphism, um, the, the val-val allele, uh, allows for normal in TMS-induced plasticity, whereas the um, uh, val-met or met-met uh, allele does not. And we actually have, um, I don't have it on here, but we have some preliminary data from the clinic looking at uh, whether this extends uh, and predicts clinical response. Uh, the monoamines kind of get a sense of this from the other earlier slides that I showed. Uh, this is uh, the lab that uh, and the folks that have made all of this work possible, uh, the funding sources and uh, collaborators that have been um, really key uh, in my career and the things that I've been working on doing. And I just want to give a quick plug for, since this is a, a European-based and an um, English-British-based, uh, um, um, well, the Brain Box Initiative is, uh, we have this coming up here and in association with this uh, annual meeting, uh, this meeting uh, in London, uh, we have a transcranial magnetic, magnetic stimulation journal, a journal of the clinical team society that's coming soon. Uh, we ex we're right on the uh, verge of uh, signing with a publisher and, and most things are all in place. And <clears throat> so hoping to make an announcement then. So for those of you interested in publishing your uh, TMS literature, um, if you can't get into brain stimulation, it'll get kicked down to us. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to do that. Another uh, more clinically oriented literature. And uh, we're hoping that this will be a, a, a consensus place where we can um, really get all the the, the one-stop shop that we need to know for, for TMS um, and the advances in that area. So with that, I appreciate everyone's time and um, we're going over a couple minutes and uh, open up to any questions.